welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, listen, why don't we do this? Let's get into the word of the Lord today. I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me as we go before the Lord in prayer and, and stand? Father, we come before you, Lord. We are just grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. You know, we don't come into this place to hear from a, an old man or a young man or a white man or a brown man or a black man for any of that matter. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. God, we don't come to church for tradition or ritualistic uh, obligation. God, we come for you. Lord, we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this house. And Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, our guidance, our counselor today. Show us the word of God and drop it into our hearts as a seed. Lord, that our hearts and our lives would be a good ground. Lord, that we would cultivate the word of God in our lives and the word that we've received tonight, Lord. And that would bear much fruit for our lives. Lord, that we would get out and be the effective church of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And shine your glory for all to see. And Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, your church. And Lord, these blessings that we ask upon ourselves. We never ask just solely upon ourselves, but upon our brothers and sisters all across the world and around the Inland Empire that are reaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, Father. We thank you that we are all many members of one body, that is the body of Christ, working together to serve the kingdom of God. And Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for our local churches in the, in the area tonight, Father, for Harvest the Grove, Father, for Sandals and the Well and the Way. Lord, we thank you for Ecclesia, Emmanuel Baptist, Lord, for uh, Crossroads, Lord, for Oak Valley, Abundant Living. Lord, we thank you for our denominational brothers and sisters, our Catholic and Baptist and Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, uh, Lord, Foursquare and Pentecostal brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for all the churches around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that we are all many members, Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ and your family, Lord, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is to be a part of such a wonderful and big family around the world. And Lord, we thank you for that. And to you be the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. I'm excited for what we've got in store tonight. 2014 is going to be an amazing year. I just can feel it, feel it in my bones. One of the reasons I know that it's going to be a good year is it started out rough. And whenever something in my life, from my experience, I realize whenever something starts out hard or there's, there seems like it's obstacle or obstacle or just one thing after the next, generally I know that something is coming behind it, man. And I tell you, it's usually the devil or something like that trying to discourage or get me down. And I tell you, I'm just excited for what God's got in store. And so... In the process of, of going before the Lord, you know, we had called a fast and uh, uh, challenged the church to a fast. And, and many of us have joined together and, and done that. Or some of us are, are finished with that. Some of us are still in, enduring and going through that. But in my time studying after God and the things of God, especially in this first month, you know, realizing and my eyes have been open to a lot of things in my own life that have been happening that I've, I've been almost uh, uh, ignorant to. And as I was praying and, and seeking after God, a lot of things and truths in my life were, were being answered and, and revealed to me. And as I was studying the Word of God, this just came so alive to me, this concept. And a few weeks ago, Pastor Deborah made a statement, and it really kind of resonated. I had my, I take notes on my, on my phone or on my iPad, and I was taking notes, and she made this statement. And it went something, I, don't, I can't, couldn't tell you exactly the statement, but the statement was that Jesus Christ won the battle. And what you and I are here to do today is to enforce that reign. We are here to enforce the victory that Jesus Christ won. Tonight I want to talk to you about winning the battles of your life. We're talking about winning the battles of your life. You see, there's going to be battles no matter what you and I do. No matter where we go, no matter how we look at it, there's always going to be a battle. There's always going to be a fight. And in thinking upon Pastor Debbie's statement about us being enforcer, enforcers, I thought... That really likened to the, the term that you and I know as an occupation or occupational. 
uh, post-war occupation. And, and we know that oftentimes in, in, in the recent wars and, and conflicts that we've seen around uh, the, the world, you know, Afghanistan and, and Iraq and these different areas. And they think of World War II after Germany and Japan. The United States stepped into these, these lands and, and occupied this area, occupied these countries or these territories, because afterwards the people are fragile. Everything's been, been torn apart. War has ripped everything apart. And there are different areas and different uh, 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 sects and, and, and groups trying to rise up and form their form of government and trying to take over. I just read in Iraq that after the United States withdrawal, Al-Qaeda has really made a push back in. And so occupation is there to enforce the winning side of the victorious party's reign or the victorious group's laws and regulations. Much like after World War II in, in Germany and, and in Japan, the United States and the Allies stepped in and they occupied that land to stop the German army from fighting. But even after the war was over, there were still conflicts. You see, the war between God and Satan was fought. Jesus Christ won the fight on the cross. The devil is defeated. You and I live in a post-war occupation time. You see, you and I are here to enforce the reign and rule of Jesus Christ in the spiritual realm here on earth. We are soldiers enlisted in the army of the Almighty God, set for a purpose to enforce the reign. Much like in occupational times, there are different battles, there are different Groups that will arise and, and, and try to take over. Just like that, just because the devil is defeated, because Jesus took the keys of sin and death uh, 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 and nailed them to the cross, like the Bible tells us in Colossians, he made a public spectacle of them. Just because the devil has been defeated doesn't mean he's going to stop fighting. He's going to rise up. He's going to try to take you and I out. He's going to try to bring things and put things in our way to discourage us from fighting. And you and I have got to realize that we are in a fight. I remember it was about a year ago, just under, uh, uh, over a year, under a year ago, I taught a message that was really on my heart about, about where's the fight in the church. And tonight I want to talk about winning the battles of our lives because you see, we are in a fight. Regardless if we realize it or not, we are in a fight for our families. We are in a fight for our, our salvation and here on the earth. We are in a fight for our friends, for our jobs, for our finances, for our children, whatever it might be, for the things that you are believing for. You are in a fight for it. And we've got to learn that we are victorious in Jesus' name. The Bible tells us in Romans, the 8th chapter, we know this. The Bible describes us, Paul the Apostle describes us as more than conquerors. The interesting statement that he says is before that, he says, therefore, we are more than conquerors. Why? Because the verses right before said that we were accounted as lambs led to the slaughter. But because Jesus Christ defeated the devil when he was nailed on the cross, when he was rose again on the third day, Jesus conquered it. You know what that means? We're more so than conquerors. Why? Because we're occupiers. The spiritual realm of darkness, the, the, the devil's uh, a realm that he thinks he has co control in, you and I have authority in, and we have got to learn that we are in a fight for our lives, we are in a battle for our lives, and we can win. So we're going to talk about winning the battles of your life. I say battles because you might win a battle, and another one will come. You're going to win another battle, and another one will come. You know, one thing about the devil, one thing about the, the forces of, the, of, the, of darkness, the, the demons and the assignments against us, is they don't stop. You would think he would get it in his head. Oh, no, 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 no. They're saved. No, no. Jesus Christ has them. All right. I tried. I tried that already. But he's a persistent one. And we've got to understand that we have battles in our life. So we're going to talk about winning the battle. Some things tonight. Some things tonight of winning the battle. Quick, easy, some real nice thoughts. I think that you'll really get something out of that. We're talking about winning the battle. Number one tonight, and winning the battle. Winning the battles for our lives. Number one, intimidation will not affect us. Got to get that right off the bat. Listen, intimidation will not affect us. You know, oftentimes, 
the, the, the works of the devil, the, the, the way that the devil would work or the assignments against us will come and they will appear more so than they are. Have you ever been in an issue? Have you ever gone through something in your life where you begin to think about in your mind, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Well, if this is going to happen and this is going to happen and this is going to happen and oh my goodness, my life's going to be over and then I have to do this and I'm going to have to do this and, 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 and all of a sudden the problem becomes huge in your eyes. You see, that's a front that the assignments or the devil wants to play against us is intimidation. Much like the physical example of David and Goliath. You know, there's some amazing truths and principles in the Bible. I think there's a reason for you and I that the Old Testament is attached to that New Testament part of your Bible. Because there are some truths that you and I have got to pull out. And here's this man. You guys all know the story of David and Goliath. Here's this great warrior representing all of the Palestinian, the Philistinian army. And he's standing out there and he's mocking the armies of Israel. The Bible tells, tells us that he was huge, that he had, had filed his teeth down so that he could, when he bit somebody in hand to hand combat, he would tear their flesh. I mean, he was trained from his youth. And the army of Israel was cowering at the sight of this man. He was calling them out, saying, Hey, I'm the best soldier in my army. You send the best out. Let's fight. Whoever wins, the army is victorious, and we will be your slaves. If we win, you'll be our slaves. If you win, we'll be your slaves. Nobody wanted to go. Here's a shepherd boy, gets it, who understands that intimidation will not affect us in our fight. See, here he goes, and he delivers the bread and the cheese to his brothers, and he hears this, he says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That defies the armies of the living God. This little ruddy kid that spent his time with stinky sheep playing a harp. He was a musician. Not a soldier. He convinces the king of Israel, Saul, to allow him to be the sole representation in this hand-to-hand -hand combat battle against a physical giant. 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. Verse number 45 is David faces Goliath. I love this. This is you and I in our battles of our life. David says to the Philistine, Hey, you come at me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. You come at me with defense, with offense, and long-range weapons. You might have me outgunned. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. goes on to say, before this day is over, I will stand on your corpse and hold your head. <laughs> Intimidation cannot and will not affect us. This is terrorism 101. Think about it. Where is the roots of terrorism? forces of darkness, the devil. Why? Because if he can strike fear into the people, they won't fight back. They look and they say, what's the hope? We can't fight a war like this. We're not used to battling like this. We can't do anything about this. You never know when the devil may strike. We just have to live in fear. Terrorism 101. There it is. Get them so afraid they won't fight back. And if you get somebody to stop fighting or not fight before the fight's begun, they've already lost. And the devil will use intimidation against you and I in our lives to get us to not show up on the day of battle so that we have already lost, so that we can stay beat down, so that we can stay broken, so that we can stay in the misery and the depression and the issues that we have in our lives rather than fighting the devil face to face, hand to hand, and showing the devil that he might come at us with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but we come at him in the name of the armies of the Most High God whom he has defiled. Just to solidify that for you. I know I've already painted that picture, but let me just show you another one because I love this. Same story a couple hundred years earlier. Twelve spies going to Israel. Again, giants in the land. Oh, we can't do it. God brought us out of Israel, they say. Ten of them say, God brought us out of Israel so that we might die at the hands of giants. Two men, Joshua and Caleb, stand up in front of the mob as they murmur and complain. They say, slap yourselves. 
This is God who brought us. And in in God's word translation, I'm going to read this to you out of a, 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 a different translation. Numbers is 14th chapter. Verse number 7, this is Joshua and Caleb rose up and said, they spoke to the whole community of Israel. The land we explore is very good. Hey, your promised land that God has for you is very good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. This is a land flowing with milk and honey. Don't rebel against the Lord. And don't be afraid of the people of the land. We will devour them like bread. Joshua and Caleb said of the, the clan of giants that everybody said could not be, de be defeated. Joshua and Caleb said because God is on our side, we will devour them like bread. You know, they say Wheaties is the breakfast of champions. Let me tell you something. Giants in your life and my life is the breakfast of us conquerors. And we'll eat the giants that the devil throws at us for breakfast. And it goes like the old saying, we can truly live by it in Christianity with God on our side. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Because we know that we fight a battle that's already been won. And here we are to enforce this battle in our life. We're talking about winning the battles. Winning the battle. Number two, we fight in the spirit by the spirit. We got to realize who we're fighting we got to realize how we're fighting. You see, you and I can show up to a fight and realize that we're fighting the wrong person. It's happened all the time. As a matter of fact, families are, are, are keen on this. When the devil comes, he'll, he'll use people as vessels, as weapons, as, 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 as vessels to drive each other apart. And we get together and we start to butt heads. But you got to realize that our battle, our issue... Our fight is not with people. We are not fighting against people. We are fighting against the principalities of darkness, the forces of the devil that are trying to use and drive people against people. Jesus Christ came to save the world. doesn't want to drive people away. People may be the weapons of choice, but you know what? We're, we as soldiers in God's army, we're after the leader. You think back to the times of war, it was soldiers of soldiers, but you know what they did? You know what their mission was? It wasn't about wiping out the army. That's, that's part of what happens. The mission is to wipe out the leader. You cut the head off of the snake, the rest of the body goes limp. And see, the devil wants to try to get us focused in on fighting against person, against person, against person, so that we don't face the real battle in our life, the spiritual battle that we fight by the Spirit of God. And we get so distracted on fighting against people that we kick against the goats, as the Bible talks about. And it's difficult. It's a long journey. It's a hard journey. Ephesians in the sixth chapter, verse number 12 Talking about the armor of God. It says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Hey, we're not in it to fight people. Church, when we realize this, it's not a battle of man versus man. Listen, I'll get a little bit edgy. I'll get a little bit on my soapbox. It's not about fighting homosexuals. It's not about fighting fornicators. It's not about boycotting people who are making bad decisions. It's not about people who, who are gluttonous or slanderers. It's not about the sinner. It's about fighting the cause of their sin and going to battle with the reason that the person is on their way to hell, that we might fight the spiritual battle through the Spirit, by the Spirit, that they might be redeemed by Jesus Christ and come to be on the side of the army of the living God. And when we as the church realize we're fighting a spiritual fight, we will be effective. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The devil's best trick he can throw at you and I when it comes to fighting the fight is to get us to fight the wrong person, or even worse, to get us to fight each other. How many times in the church do we bicker at each other? Well, you said this, and I was offended by that. Or you did this, and, and, and that hurt me. 
or, or, or you didn't do that, or you left me out, of whatever it might be, you looked at me the wrong way. And we start fighting with each other. And that's the, the bait that Satan uses to divide us because the Bible tells us that a house divided against itself cannot stand. We oftentimes pick the wrong fight. You know, looking at Jesus as an example, let's just use the Jesus as an example. You know, think about it. All throughout his ministry, Jesus was challenged. He was, he was uh, confronted by the religious, by the people of God. There was, there was often times where there was somebody that was conflicted by a spirit of infirmity or something like that. You know, Jesus never spoke out of turn. You know, he said harsh words to them. He said things that they needed to hear. He told them the truth of their situation. But every time Jesus dealt with somebody, he dealt with the issue, not the person. When the man, when they, when they came across the man that was uh, filled with a legion of demons in the wilderness, Jesus didn't speak to the man. He spoke to the demons because that was where the issue lied. And as the demons were cast out, the man was redeemed. We've got to learn that we can't pick the wrong fights. We can't get so wrapped up in pettiness that we fight each other and we miss out on the battle that's at hand. We have got to focus our efforts on the head of the snake, on the head of the evil, and put all of our efforts there and cut the head of the snake off and watch the rest of the army go win. We're talking about winning the battles. You guys with me tonight? I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to you. So even if you're not with me, I'm getting it. So we're good. We're talking about winning the battles. Number three, we are equipped to succeed by God. We are equipped to succeed by God. Since we're speaking about battles, think about it. We as a church enlisted in the Lord's army. Paul says, you know, nobody who entangles himself in warfare doesn't do their due diligence to study their opponent. We are in a battle. You say, oh, Pastor, look, I, I, I avoid confrontation. Me too, but we're still fighting a fight. And who, we, as, as we as soldiers in the Lord's army, we have been equipped by God to succeed. You see, in our fight, we don't have to worry about budget cuts. We don't have to worry about defense cuts. We don't have to worry about administration changes and policy changes that all of a sudden we were doing one thing and now all of a sudden we're going to do something else because somebody else is in charge. Why? Because God is in charge. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God has given you and I everything we need to succeed in the fight. Do you remember in the, in the Iraqi war, the big news article that the soldiers were going through the garbage piles to try to find armor to stick in their uniforms because they weren't given enough for the fights? I remember reading that and just thinking, my goodness, you see, we don't live in a, in a time, we don't live, we don't operate in a place where God says, well, here's just a little bit so that you can get it done. God says, I have given you the whole armor of God. I have given you everything you need, both defensive and offensive, to fight the fight, and not just to fight the fight, but to fight the fight and come out alive and on top. God gives us everything we need to fight the enemy successfully. We're in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. I'm going to read this again out of, the, out of the Good News translation. Go ahead and put it up on the overhead. Ephesians in the sixth chapter. God's word translation, excuse me. Kind of a modern day vernacular. Finally, listen to this. Receive your power from the Lord and from his mighty strength. You see, he's given it to you. It's there. It's for your taking. The Bible encourages us to put on the armor of God. You know the decision that you and I have is to put it on or not. Think about it. We're talking about winning the battles. Oftentimes, we don't want to put the armor on. Oftentimes, we don't feel like putting on the armor. Oftentimes, we're so tired of fighting against the devil that we're just over it. You know what? Whatever. We can't be whatever. He says, receive the power from the Lord and his mighty strength. God has given you the ability, the grace of God, his divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it, which means he already won the battle. You are there to enforce it. Receive the power from the Lord and from his mighty strength. Verse number 11 goes on to say, put on the armor that God supplies. He gave it to you. You got saved. You got a package delivery that moment. You got the armor. You got the breastplate, the helmet, the, the, the shin guards, the belt, the shield, the sword. You are ready to go. You are armed and ready to fight the fight. Like Paul the Apostle says. It's like they say from the old western. Never bring a knife to a gunfight. Hey, you are heavily armed. 
You got to understand that. You are equipped to succeed. You are bringing a knife to a gunfight with the devil. The devil thinks he's got you in a corner. He doesn't realize the artillery that you're packing. He doesn't understand the amount that you have. Now, I'm not talking about physical. All right? Because remember, we said we're, we, we fight by the Spirit. In the spirit. So some people are like, hallelujah, praise God, Pastor Luke. I am not talking about you packing the gun. Okay? <laughs> I am talking about your spiritual armor and warfare. God has given it, and you are packing heat. you got to understand that. He might have something big on you. You have a bigger gun. All right? Always be on the side that has a bigger gun. You are on that side because God is there with you. He has supplied everything we need. 2 Corinthians in the 10th chapter, it says that we walk by flesh. We don't know war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Mighty in God. Do you see that these descriptive factors, that the, the, uh, these descriptive words that the Bible gives us over and over, more than conquerors, mighty in pulling down. The whole armor, God's supplies. You see, God's desire for you and I is to realize that we are ready and geared to go to battle against the devil and win. But we have got to realize that. We've got to remember that, yeah, you may have heard that. Oh, Pastor Luke, I learned about the armor of God when I was a kid. Oh, Pastor Luke, I learned about that in the fighting the fight of faith when I was a teenager and youth. Pastor Luke, I heard about that from my mama and dad. Listen, it's time for you to get over about learning it, and it's time for you and I to start living it. Because it's one thing to know it, and it's one thing to use it. But God has supplied all that we need to fight the fight. We don't have to worry about shortages. We don't have to worry about being sent in underprepared. We are packing heat. Amen. Amen. Last one for tonight. You guys, got, you guys okay for one more? Yeah. Last one for tonight. We're talking about winning the battle. Number four, we are backed by the name of Jesus. We are backed by the name of Jesus. You see, like soldiers who proudly bear the insignia or the, the flag or the colors of the country that they represent, that says something. In times of occupation, when they have that flag or that insignia or that uniform of the victorious nation, that says something. That says, I am in a position of authority. What I say, you listen to. Why? Because you were defeated. We are victorious. You and I are like soldiers who wear the insignia. You see, we wear the colors of God's army, the royal colors. You and I have the rank on our collars because we have been commissioned by God to get out there and to fight the fight of faith, to finish it, to go and continue on and to show the devil where he belongs. And we are backed by the name of Jesus Christ. Which means that we've got to remember that. You see, you don't win battles because you sit in church. You don't win battles because your parents told you you were a Christian. You don't win battles because you have some faith or positive thinking. You win the battles because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Which means, church, you and I have got to not be afraid to say the name Jesus. We can water it down. We can do whatever we want in our society or day and age. But let me tell you something. You can never remove Jesus and have victory because victory coincides with Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That's why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power unto salvation. Why? Because it is Jesus that we are here. It is because of Jesus that we win. It is because of Jesus that when we fight, the devil runs. Jesus. I thank God that I was raised in such a godly family that when the devil, when, when my thoughts would come at me, my parents taught me, don't cry out to us, cry out to Jesus. I remember, you think that's funny because you're like, man, what great parents. No, they were there. Mom and dad were always there. But when I had something that would scare me at night, 
When I had something that was attacking me or, 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 or trying to intimidate me at night, my parents taught me from a very young age, the, the age when I could memorize anything, they taught me to memorize, uh, uh, for I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. And I would quote the scriptures when I was afraid, and I would watch myself get over it. Because it is the power of God, it is the Jesus Christ that brings us our salvation. We've got to understand that. Philippians, the second chapter, verse number 9, says, Therefore, speaking of Jesus who, who humbled himself, became a man, because Jesus Christ was obedient unto death, God, verse number 9, has, uh, Philippians, the second chapter, God has also highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Those in heaven, those on earth, I love this, I've talked about this before, those under the earth means that no matter where you go, you can't escape it. Whether you admit it or not, you will. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. That every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. It's the name of Jesus that is the authority in which we operate. We should never be ashamed. We were sent by Jesus in his name, in his great commission. In Mark, the 16th chapter, we'll conclude with this. Jesus, as he's talking to his disciples, he says, And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. Now, they didn't do that, so if you guys are in the back, we'll highlight that. If you got that in your Bible, circle or underline or to do whatever you need to do, because there is the key. He says, These signs will follow those who believe in me. In my name. Not in your name. Not in Pastor Jim's name. Not as we saw in the book of Acts, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. No, in the name of Jesus Christ whom I believe, who lives on the inside of me, who has already defeated you, who saw you fall like lightning from heaven. In the name, in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Verse number 18 goes on to say, They will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You know what that means? In my name, they will win. Because of the name of Jesus. Because of Jesus Christ. We serve a big God. We serve a big God. Battles will come and they will go. This is our period. This is our life as a period of occupation. But we know this. Soldiers, stay the course. Weather the storm. Because the devil has already been defeated. And you have got to realize that you, by the power of God in the name of Jesus, are destined to win the fights that come your way. When giants are in front of your promise, you can look at them and say, I won't be intimidated anymore, but I will have my strong breakfast this morning, and I will eat me some giants for breakfast, devil. You want to bring them? Let's eat them. We can look at our lives, and we can realize that we are fighting in the spirit by the Spirit. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Next time you look at your family member and you just keep working at it and keep fighting at it, you know what I say? I love you. The devil's trying to drive us apart. The devil's trying to put something against us. But you know what? You are my family. You are my friends. You are my brothers. You are my sisters in Christ, whatever it may be. I'm not fighting against you. I'm fighting against that punk devil that's trying to split me up from you. We fight in the Spirit by the Spirit. we got to realize and remember who we're fighting. Remember that God has equipped us God has given us everything we need to win that fight. And remember that we are backed by the name of Jesus. We bear the insignia of the royal family. That is the family of God, of Almighty God. And when we go out and we speak in the name of Jesus, the principalities of darkness have no choice but to listen and run when we speak according to the word of God. Did you guys get something out of that tonight? fighting the battles of our life. Amen? Amen? Tell you what, I love the fact that we are more than conquerors. When the devil comes at you, say, listen, you were already defeated. I'm just here to let you know it, to remind you of it. I remember there was an old Carmen. Anybody remember Carmen, like in the 90s? Yeah. Man, Carmen was so cool. 
Well, there was this one play, remember, that he was talking about the devil was using all those devices, remember that? And he was like, you know, tell them this and do this and do this and remind them of their past. And the little demon in hell was quivering. He's like, but sir, if you remind them of their past, they'll remind you of your future. And the whole church erupts and he was praying and the devil jumps in the lake of fire. Why? Because when the devil tries to bring up those things, all you got to do is listen and remember. Devil, you are already destined for somewhere. It's just a matter of time. Here I am just to enforce and to remind you that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. That the Lord will rise up a standard against you. That I will resist you and you shall flee in the name of Jesus. And we can be victorious in our lives. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Hey, listen, let me do one more thing as the ushers are just finishing up what they're doing. Let me ask you to just do this. Give me just a moment more of your attention. I want to ask you a very important question. I want to talk to you something about something very important. It'd be, it'd be a shame for us to get together, hear the Word of God, talk about being victorious and, and, and doing all that stuff and not give you the opportunity to look into your heart, to look into your life. You see, the Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So let me ask you a question. I want you to examine yourself. Look in your heart, look in your life, and be honest with your answer. If you were to leave tonight and you were to die, heaven forbid, you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? Boom, just like that. Where would it go? You think you're going to get to heaven? Now, let me ask you this. What makes you think you're going to get there? What makes you so sure? You know, you might say, well, you know, I, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I hope so. I want to. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God can you find or can you see that you can think or you can hope or you can want or wish your way into heaven? You see, you can't get there because of your own positive outlook on life or because you have, uh, 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 they're, you're the most happy all the time, like the, the, the most happy person gets to heaven. You, it's not about that. It's not some mental thing or anything like that. You can't get to heaven because you want to, because you hope so, because you wish so. There's more to it. Oftentimes I think, well, you know, I'm going to get to heaven because I'm going to go to heaven because my parents told me that. You know, they told me if I was a good kid or a good person, I I'm going to go to heaven. We, th we think of that all across America. Good people go to heaven. Let me tell you something. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that good people get into heaven? The Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. It doesn't matter if you don't cheat on your taxes or, or you do good deeds or you give to charitable organizations like the Red Cross or, or, or things like that or you stand for social justice. It doesn't matter. You see, our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do would ever get, make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because God's standard for heaven is perfection. And the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Which means no matter what you and I do, no matter what we try on the outside or how we try to appear or how we try to act on the outside will never make us good enough to get into heaven. You know, you can't get to heaven because your parents told you you were a Christian. You can't get to heaven because you sit in church or because you, you hear the pastor speak. You're not going to get to heaven because you volunteer or because you serve in the children's or the youth ministry or you carry the pastor's Bible. Nowhere in the Word of God are you going to find that. You see, the only way you and I can get to God's heaven is God's way. Not on our deeds, not on our actions, not on our looks, not on our hopes or our desires. The only way we could get there is God's way. And Jesus Christ says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. Which means you and I can't get to heaven any other way but God's way. And Jesus Christ was speaking to a man, a man by the name of Nicodemus in John, the third chapter. Nicodemus was a, the Bible tells us he was of the Pharisees, a leader of the Jews. What that means is that Nicodemus was a religious leader of his day. Nicodemus had memorized the Old Testament, spent his young life studying the Word of God. He taught in the synagogue and he gave to the poor and he did all the right things and said all the right things. And as Jesus and Nicodemus are conversing and discussing eternal life in heaven, you would think that Jesus would say to Nicodemus in John the third chapter, you just keep on going, keep in the direction that you're going. Great is your reward. Jesus says to Nicodemus these words, the plan of God, God's way. Here they are. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's it. There it is. God's way. You say, oh, man, born again. I, 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 you're talking about that crazy, out of control, weirdo Christianity kind of thing. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not buying what you're selling. Listen, I don't care what Hollywood, I don't care what popular, uh, popular culture or society is made out of that. They have no concept of who God is or what he is. And so they might make it out to sound one way or the other, but let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. Ready? It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. The Bible, in Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. He says to people like you and I, I'm going to come back. And I better find you hot or I better find you cold because he says, if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whoa. 
Shocking statement from the mouth of Jesus. And what he is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let's think about that. Let's analyze that in terms of your relationship. Lukewarm simply means that you're a little bit up and you're a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out. You know, occasional church attendance, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. You're just not fully committed. You know, in any other relationship on the face of the earth that you go through, if you were that, in that way in any other relationship, you know it wouldn't be a successful relationship. Yet we think we can be that way with God and he'll honor and respect it. Let me love you enough, let me respect you enough that God is after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. It's not about your mental ascent towards him. It's not about your carnal knowledge of who Jesus is. I already know that you know who Jesus Christ is. Why? Because you're here today. That's not good enough to get you into heaven. You see, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. In just a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place with God in heaven forever. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and I'm going to count to three. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible just like that. Bang! And when I do, I want to give you the opportunity to make the commitment tonight in your heart, in your life, with Jesus Christ and go forward. And what I want to ask you to do when I count to three, bang, smack my hand on my Bible. I want to ask you to pop your hand up. We'll do it all at the same time, all together. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ my heart. I want to I acknowledge I want to give him my heart. Pastor Luke, today, I want to make that decision. I want to make that commitment. I'm a man. I'll see you. You see, Jesus Christ said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him before men, he will deny you before his father. So you see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, well, I, I can't raise my hand. I'm going to be embarrassed. Let me tell you something. I want to encourage you to get over that. Don't let a moment, remember that intimidation? Intimidation will not affect us. Don't let a moment of embarrassment or intimidation stop you from making the best decision you'll ever make for the rest of your life. You see, you wouldn't be embarrassed if you inherited a large sum of money and bought a, a big house on the beach or a luxury car or something like that. You would want to show it off. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed or intimidated about making the best decision you will ever make. Today is your day. Who should raise their hands? Well, if you've never given Jesus Christ your heart, you've never given him your life in just a moment, when I count to three, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, you can put it right back down. Who should raise their hands? In just a moment, if that's you, if you, maybe you've given your heart, maybe you did this as a kid, or you did this and made the commitment, but you never really followed through with it, you did this at a Billy Graham or a Harvest Crusade, but you never really acted upon it. If that's you today, if you're not sure, hey, make sure today, don't walk out of this place without making sure. That's a gamble on your life you can't afford to make. Who should raise their hand? Finally, if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. If you've been running from God instead of to God, in just a moment, get your hand up. I'll see it all. Acknowledge it and put it right back down. And let's ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever. Oftentimes, we hear people say, well, you know, I, I'm just not sure about heaven or hell, Pastor Luke. I, I don't know if they really exist. Let me tell you something. Just because you can't see it, because you can't feel it, because you don't experience it yet doesn't mean it's not real. You know, listen, we've got radio waves and microwaves and everything flying around the air that we can't see, but yet we know it's there. It's the same thing. Heaven's a real place. Real enough for God to tell us about it. Real enough for Jesus Christ to teach us about it. It's real enough for you and I to take it serious. We hear, well, you know, I have a hard time uh, accepting a God who makes it his business to condemn and send people to hell. Let me tell you something. You walked into this place. God didn't whack you over the head with a two-by-four. He's not some kid up there with a magnifying glass here out to torture you. God did everything he could to send Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die a beaten bloody mess on the cross so that you would give him your heart, give him your life. He's not in the business of sending and condemning you to hell. It was never designed for you. It was never intended for you. And it's your free will choice to make. Today. It's your decision. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, from the front to the back, in the family rooms, if that's you in just a moment, get ready. Whether you're in the foyer or listening to my voice, uh, the sound of my voice around this campus, if that's you, get ready. The moment is here. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. It's God speaking to you right now. This is the first moment of the rest of your life, the best decision you'll ever make. This is your moment. Don't pass it by. I'm going to count to three. Wherever you're at, get ready. Pop your hand up. Be bold. Make the statement. And let's go forward in your relationship with God, ensuring your place in heaven today, leaving hell behind. Here we go. Ready? One. Two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two, I see you. Three, four, I got you right there. Five, I see the hand. In the family room, is that one? Six in the family room. Six wise people. Anybody else in this place today? I see the ushers pointing. Seven, I got you. Where I see you right, give me a little bit of wave. Eight, I got you. 
Anybody else in this place today, you want to give him your heart, you want to give him your life, you say, man, I wonder if I should, hey, come on, this is your moment. Where are you at? Stop playing games with God. Let's go forward in your relationship with God. Eight wise people, I know that there's more than that in this place. Where are you at, number nine? Where are you at, number 10? Saying, I wonder if I should. Come on, this is your moment. This is your day. Anybody else in this place today, you want to give him your heart, you want to give him your life. Anybody else today, go ahead and pop your hand up. And listen, I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else in this place today, I'm going to close it up right now. Where are you at? Anybody else? Well, praise God for eight or nine wise people. Hallelujah. Now, here's what we're going to do. Those of you that raised your hand, those of you that should have raised your hand, but you didn't, shame on you. Here's what we're going to do. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, hey, listen, I want to make that commitment. I'll see it today. You get saved by making Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, by believing and confessing that he is Lord and rose from the dead. Let us pray a prayer with you. Let us get some information in your hands. Let us follow through with you today. If it was important enough for you to make the commitment, it's important enough for you to follow through and start the right way. So here's what we're going to do. For those of you that raised your hand or those of you that didn't raise your hand, Elijah in just a moment is going to sing a song. We're all going to stand together. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get in the aisle and come meet me here at the altar, and we're going to change destinies together. If that's you in this place, don't leave. Listen, if you came with somebody and they raise their hand, say, hey, listen, I'll go with you. Or if you brought somebody, say, hey, listen, will you come with me? Or you came with somebody, say, will you come with me? Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me here at this altar, and let's change destinies together. Come on, let's all stand, please. Nobody leave at this time. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on. This is your moment. Come on down. God. As they're still coming, we'll wait for them. But as we do, I want you guys to just listen up. Come on, yeah, come on. We'll wait. God is good. Hey, listen, guys. I want to tell you something. You're not going to a funeral, all right? You're going to a birthday celebration, which means today is the first day of the rest of your life. This is a good decision, the best decision you're ever going to make, all right? So you got to smile. you got to be happy about that because this is a new day for you. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. Like Noel, Joel. All right, Pastor Joel is going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Listen, if you made it through me, you got through the weirdest you're going to get here at the church, all right? Nothing weird goes on. He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all right? He's going to give you some free literature, some things to help you get strong, to point you in the right direction. So as you walk out of this place, you say, now where do I go? We're going to help direct you in that right direction. Last thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. We call them spiritual personal trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, make sure that you're working out and doing all the right things, not wasting your time, not working, you know, doing, using the machines the right way. We got spiritual personal trainers, a friend, somebody that will meet with you right before church. They'll teach you some things about the word of God for five weeks, get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to the life that you came from, but you get strong and go forward for what God has for you. And you start winning those battles that God has directed you to win. So if you guys would just go to your left, my right, right over there with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord 
and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.